Is this good? Hey everyone, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna get started in a second, but, but before we do, I just thought it'd be nice to say a few words about the Africa Center for anyone joining us for the first time today. Uh, my name is Tunde 
Ola Tunji, I'm the Associate Director of Policy here at the Africa Center. Uh, we are a fairly multidisciplinary institution. Our work is across the fields of arts and culture, policy and business, and our primary focus is narrative change around the continent of Africa. So for us, we think it's really important how the world comes to understand the continent of Africa and its people and its diaspora, and also what kind of information gets to shape that understanding. And so we wanna make sure that the narratives do justice to the lived experiences of the people that they pertain to. Um, and on the story of narratives, um, the story of Patrice Lumumba is really interesting and relevant to the work that we do because in the aftermath of his death, I remember um, one of the prevailing narratives was this idea that there's really nothing to see here. This was just kind of business as usual. It was Africans fighting amongst them selves and this is just how things work um the story was that the belgians had left and in this absence in this power vacuum there was a scramble for power mr lumumba lost his life that way and that's really all there was to it um this narrative pre pre prevailed for a long time because it really fit into our understanding of the continent at the time how business worked there how politics were there this is just how people vie for power there um we've obviously since learned that that wasn't the case it's far more complex and there is way more blame to be apportioned than initially um, imagined. And so um, that's why we think, that's why I think books like Swords are so and so important because they really do help, help us kind of clear up a lot of the uncertainty. And I think what we thought were just kind of rumors growing, growing, growing up. Um, but um, one more quick thing before I get, get these guys up here. Um, I just want to say it's a phenomenal book, but at the but at the end of the day, we are talking about Patrice Lumumba as a person. I think it's important to just acknowledge and uh, ex ex express that his passing really was a pivotal moment for not just the Congolese people, but the continent of Africa as a whole. In many ways, his political life embodied so many of the ideals and aspirations of the continent at the time and now. And um, I think um, he represented just, uh, so many of the qualities that we long for in our leaders today on on the continent. So in 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 respect of of his legacy and what he meant to the continent, I think is up to us to ensure that we give as fair and honest an accounting of history as possible. And um, I think Stewart's book is a phenomenal step in the right direction in that in that in that case. Um, all right. All that said, uh, let me bring let's bring let's bring them up here as soon as we can. Um, Stuart Reed is an executive editor at Foreign Affairs. Ma Foreign Affairs Magazine. He's written for many other notable notable publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, and the Atlantic, amongst many others. And he will be joined in conversation by Uzo Demaiwala, who is CEO here at the Africa Center and also an acclaimed writer in his own right, actually. Um, he Some of his notable works include the novel Speak No Evil and Beasts of No Nation, which has actually since been adapted into a movie starring Idris Elba that you can watch on Netflix now well not now you should watch this now and but after but um please help me welcome them to the stage Uzo and Stuart we're good all right um First of all, thank you very much, Tunde. Um, it's really good to see everybody here tonight, and I'm so excited to be able to um, share the stage with you, Stuart. We got a lot to talk about. Um, as Tunde said, this is a phenomenal book, um, and all of you, uh, just so you know, I'm gonna do this now, and then I'll do it again at the end of the talk. We have copies for sale um, at the front. Make sure you buy this book, um, support Stuart, support writers. Um, get your autograph because he'll be signing as well. Um, it is a phenomenal book and it's a book that really does two things. I think one, it contextualizes, um, as Tunde was saying, the history of the Congo um, and of Lumumba himself. And at the same time also brings that particular period into the larger um, essence of what was happening across the globe at the time. Um, and I don't think we have enough stories that really contextualize African affairs in that way. And so thank you to you for doing that. Um, before we um, get into that, though, I want to just welcome all of you here to the Africa Center. Events like this, it really is wonderful to have your support supporting writers who are writing about the continent of Africa, who are telling different stories about the continent of Africa, and who are really getting into who we are historically and who we are and where we're going. 
Um, so with that said, um, we'll talk about socials and all that stuff where you can follow us later. Um, but let me ask Stuart the first question, which is, can you give us just some context uh, for the Congo at that time, the time of independence or pre-independence, independence, and of course the short uh, realm of Lumumba's reign? Sure, thank you so much for having me and for everyone for coming. So Congo became independent from Belgium in June 1960, and it was a rushed independence that the Belgians agreed to only belatedly and did very little next to no pre preparation for. So Lumumba himself was, Patrice Lumumba was prime minister of Congo. He had um, been a postal clerk in the colonial administration. He was arrested for embezzlement and after prison remade himself as a beer promoter and then got involved in anti-colonial politics. And so he won an election to be uh, a parliamentary election before independence, upon independence as prime minister, and then everything sort of goes to hell in a handbasket in Congo very, very quickly. The uh, army mutinies, there was a all-white officer corps, which was a holdover from colonialism, all-white, all-Belgian, and the black rank and file obviously was not too excited about that, so they rebelled against their officers. Uh, the Belgian military intervened without Congolese permission, ostensibly to protect its citizens, but it looked to everyone like a recolonization. And uh, a province, the mineral-rich province of Katanga, seceded. So within just days of independence, the country was falling apart. And that's when Lumumba went to the United Nations for help. Right. So there are a lot of players in this in this narrative. There are a lot of players at this moment, United Nations, United States, Belgium, other you know, old colonial powers. Um, but before we get deeper into the story, let's talk a little bit about why this particular story. What drew you first and foremost to this? So I went to Congo in 2014. It was I was writing a magazine article about something more present day focused, unrelated, and I was taken with the country upon visiting it. And then I started reading up on its history. And the more I read, the more I realized there was this great untold story, or at least it had been untold to me. I barely knew anything about it. I hadn't been told about the Congo crisis, as it was called. But it was front page news of the New York Times every day in the summer of 1960, basically. Mm. It was the big Cold War crisis of the era. Um, and so why had I not learned anything about it? Why had I basically never heard of this? And then the more I read, the more I realized there was also these great characters at the heart of the story. Lumumba himself above all, above all else, but also Mobutu, who would go on to rule the country for more than 30 years, Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the UN. So there were these sort of larger than life characters and the story just felt like it was sitting there ready to be written. Right, right. Okay, and so now back to these characters and back to the moment. So, you know, Lumumba, you've told us a little bit about him, but let, actually tell us a little bit more. Who was this person? So, yes, he was a, um, a, a postal clerk and a, a tradesman. Like, what, what describe him for us? He was very mer mercurial. He was extremely charismatic. I mean, I think that was one thing his bitterest foes and his closest allies all agreed on was that this man had a silver tongue and could really just um, have, you know, have the crowd wrapped around his finger. And, uh, but it wasn't purely emotional appeal. He also um, made, you know, convincing legal and logical arguments, but he really could speak to people and, and campaign extremely effectively. Mm -hmm. He was a great political organizer too, um, and that explained his su success. But, you know, but as this I... This was a, a man who also didn't really have a formal education, right? Because at the time, the Belgians were not allowing uh, Congolese to actually go to school. Yeah, he was an autodidact. He read furiously. He joined a library. He took correspondence courses in French. Um, the, the whole Belgian strategy was, they had this phrase, no elites, no problems. And so the idea was, if you prevent a political class from emerging by denying them educational opportunities, by denying them professional advancement, then they won't start agitating for independence. 
the way that seemed to be happening in other colonies. Right. And that strategy, I mean, they were right until a point when it was they were totally wrong and it, it blew up in their face. Right. And so he educates and he's really a self-made man. And then he gets into politics. How? He so after he's arrested for embezzlement, he moves to the capital Congo. He was in a city called Stanleyville, now Kisangani. He moves to the capital of Congo, Leopoldville, um, and remakes himself as a beer promoter. Uh, you know, going from bar to bar, promoting his brewery's beer over another brewery's beer. And in that environment, that's 1957, 1958, there start to be the first glimmers of independence movements in Congo, um, which is strikingly late compared to other mm -hmm. colonies in Africa. And he co-founds a political party, the Congolese National Movement. Um, he becomes friends with a journalist named Joseph Mobutu. Um, and it's really in, in Leopoldville in the very late 50s that he finally becomes sort of a, a political actor. Right. And now in terms of the larger independence movement, both across the continent, but then specifically in the Congo, can you speak a little bit about that? It's something you touch on in the in the book. Yeah. So what was striking was how late it happened in Congo. And the reason for that is that the Belgians had a very different colonial strategy from the French and the British. Um, the French and the British, uh, my theory about it is that because Belgium was a second rate European power, it also had a sort of less sophisticated colonial policy in a way. I mean, obviously colonialism is inherently repressive, unjust uh, activity, but the way the Belgians pursued it was um, they didn't allow any opportunities. They had no proto legislature. So in French West Africa, which became Senegal, you had, you had a legislature which had certain limited powers. You had a representative from French West Africa sitting in the National Assembly in Paris. You had none of that sort of proto-democratic infrastructure in Congo. And so as a result, when it became independent, there were fewer institutions for them to use and, and turn into their own. Mm. And so that's what then led to a lot of the crisis that Lumumba stepped into in advocating for independence. Yeah, and at a more practical level after independence, when there was the mutiny, there was this massive flight of Belgians who were um, sort of running the country at a technical level, all the air traffic controllers, you know, um, doctors, teachers, that sort of thing, because it was impossible to be any of those things and be Congolese, they were all Belgian and then they fled. And so the, at a basic fundamental level, the country just didn't work at that point. So there's really no political infrastructure and also very little hard infrastructure at that time. Right. Um, in the book, you do a really good job of, of painting all of these different characters. It wasn't just Lumumba who was influential at the time. There were so many other figures, both Congolese and from outside, who were central characters in this whole story of essentially what made the Congo of the moment and how the Congo of today is then affected by that. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these other folks who are in Lumumba's orbit, in the political orbit, and also in the whole colonial apparatus? Sure. So one obvious one is Mobutu, who starts out as Lumumba's errand boy, basically, his private secretary. He's the junior partner in the relationship, um, you know, sorts through his mail in Brussels, that sort of thing. And after the mutiny, Lumumba makes the fateful decision to put Mobutu in charge of the army because he had, Mobutu had served in the military, which would end up altering the course of Congolese and world history, arguably. Um, and their relationship is this fascinating, I mean, it's this real betrayal um, because Mobutu eventually turns on Lumumba. Um, spoiler alert, that's spoiler. Like, just in case you didn't know. And then, I mean, another character that uh, I wish I could have given her more space was um, this woman named Andre Blouin, mm -hmm. um, who maybe some people have heard of, maybe not. Um, she was uh, born in uh, French Equatorial Africa, then raised in an orphanage in the French Congo across the river from the Belgian Congo moved to Guinea and became this sort of political activist and advisor to Lumumba eventually. Um, and the final Congolese person in Lumumba's orbit I'll mention is um, Thomas Kanza, his ambassador to the UN. One of the, there, there were fewer than 20 
Congolese university graduates in the entire world upon independence. That's because 20. I think people, we just need to to pause on that. There were fewer than 20 graduates at that time. Yeah. So you're talking about a set of people who are trying to run a country without that, that without, you know, having the university educations, without having sort of the knowledge of the political systems outside of Congo, because they were starved of this. And of those 20 odd university graduates, only two were in the government. So um, that was a real deficit. I mean, the Belgians basically only very belatedly had this university open and that allowed. So we're talking about very few doctors that were Congolese. I think there was not a single Congolese doctor. There was one Congolese lawyer and he slipped through the cracks because his father was Italian. Mm. So there, it was remarkable the degree to which they really stunted all professional opportunities. Right. So they were really working with very little at the time of independence. Yes. Right? And so back to Thomas Kanza. So he uh, he's a fascinating figure and wrote this wonderful memoir in the 70s. Uh, he had studied at Harvard. He met Eleanor Roosevelt there. Um, and he was Lumumba's ambassador to the UN. At how old? 26, I think. Okay. All right. All these people were 20s, 30s, basically. And Lumumba at this time was how old? 34. Okay. Um, I'm 40 now, and I have not yet run a country. <laughs> you would be the grand old statesman <laughs> exactly. of Congress politics. Um, yep. And yeah, Thomas Kenza was you know, endlessly frustrated with his friend Lumumba. He was an ally of his. Um, but Lumumba sort of rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. He was impulsive, somewhat erratic, but he was also dealing with a fast moving crisis and lots of you know, various plots against him. Right. And then let's talk about a couple of other figures, Kasavubu, for mm. example. Tell us a little bit about him. So he was Congo's president. So Lumumba was prime minister, Kasavubu was president. Um, he was older, uh, he was taciturn and silent and, and uh, not a, a man of action, but much more of a wait and see and uh, stand back and, and make his, you know, bide his time. And um, he also was a more of a separatist sort of, he was from the, um, the back Congo ethnic group and sort of advocated a form of their own self-rule. He advocated this you know, in different ways at different times. Um, and he also would prove crucial because he fires Lumumba as prime minister at, at this key moment in September 1960. Okay, so we've got a couple of the main characters of this of this drama, but who from, for example, the Belgians, um, who are some of the folks there that we need to pay attention to that were part of this mix that created this crisis that eventually both birthed Lumumba and also ended him as a leader? On the Belgian side, um, it's sort of, the way they, I think, come across in my book, perhaps, is like a series of faceless Belgians. Um, in Katanga, however, that's the secessionist province, there were these two diplomats, um, Daspemont Linden is the name of one, and Rothschild is the name of the other. And they, the Belgians really backed this secession. It was, you know, after the country is chaotic in the mutiny, uh, Katanga, the mineral rich province, that was seen as the Belgian toehold. Like, okay, the rest of the country is in chaos. Well, we'll protect our mineral interests in this place. Um, and so there were a ton of Belgians on the ground there and, you know, working in common cause with the local secessionists as well. Okay. So now I know, I mean, you've written 400 pages about <laughs> this, but as best as you can, can you take us through the seeds of the crisis and how, and just set up the crisis for us so we can understand you know, how Lumumba, you know, this 34-year-old man, charismatic dude, I really did just say that. <laughs> uh, we're going we to wind that back a little bit. But this, you know, 34-year-old autodidact charismatic man now steps into this and has to manage a crisis in a quote-unquote country, right, that is the size of all of Western Europe, where movement is not super easy. Um, you've got many different peoples, many different, you know, essentially ethnic groups, um, that you have to manage and build coalitions with. How? What, what exactly is going on? How do we get to that point? So, as I mentioned, there's the mutiny, and then Lumumba calls in the United Nations right. and sends a telegram to Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary but, but General. But before we get to the mutiny, let's talk about how does Lumumba become Prime Minister? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. So, in um, his political party, the Congolese National Movement, is unique in that it's actually promoting a unitary 
nationalist government and not this or that ethnic groups, you know, uh, interests. And I think that becomes, the reason for that is Lumumba himself was from a very small ethnic group, the Bata Tela. And so it wouldn't have been a winning political strategy for him to advocate on behalf of his own people. Mm. Also, he had traveled widely across Congo and been sort of rootless within the borders of the colony. And therefore, um, I think had much more of a national identity. Uh, so he's truly, he feels truly Congolese. Yeah. And in, in, an, in a nation that is really just forming a sense of itself. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was a, a fiction in a way, just lines on a map drawn in Europe. But for him and for his allies, it had become real. And it was sort of, I think the thinking was, well, the one thing the Belgians gave us was this, you know, these borders and, and a sense of unity. Let's like at least take that. Um, in spite of all the other terrible things. And so, but I think part of your question is how did the Belgians agree to finally right. allow for independence to happen? And there, so in 1955, there was a Belgian academic who wrote a, an essay called the 30 year plan for the Belgian Congo. Mm. So the idea was that by 1985, the country would finally be ready for independence. Okay. He almost got fired because that was seen as a heretical, radical idea. It was way too soon. It okay. would take 50, 60 years. Right. So that was in 1955. Things changed very quickly. The Belgians look at what's happening in Algeria with the anti-colonial war against the French there, and they realize they don't want to have a have a war to you know hold on to their colony. There's a riot in the capital of Congo in 1959. So Belgium decides, okay, we've got to offload this colony finally, even though just years ago we had imagined that it would stay on for, for decades and decades. So they hold this round table conference in Brussels with the Congolese leaders meeting the Belgian politicians and sort of hash out an arrangement where this was in January, 1960. Mm -hmm. In June, the country would be independent. So at the very beginning of 1960, most people didn't so, think hold on, hold would on. become independent. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want people to, to hear this. So in January, a decision is made that power will be transferred into a place where there are no real structures of government, right? At this point in time, where you don't have a political class necessarily. And this country, right, in quotes, is the size of the entirety of Western Europe. And six months later, there's supposed to be elections and a functioning government. Right. So I feel like this is kind of a setup. I'm just saying. Yeah. I mean... The, there was this sort of perverse dynamic where all the Congolese politicians were competing with each other to have more aggressive demands for independence, which was also understandable because, you know, they had been living under colonial rule for so long. And so why not, you know, today, not tomorrow. And then the Belgian government was also just paranoid about, um, you know, and things were, the administration was sort of starting to unravel in Congo. There were um, more protests. There were, you know, people weren't paying their taxes. There were signs that they were losing control and therefore they had to rid themselves of the colony as quickly as possible. Mm. So that's why, that's what explains the extraordinary speed. Right, right. And so they go into elections and what happens? And Lumumba campaigns across the country um, with his message of a united Congo and nationalism and when his party wins the most votes, um, and so that's in May 1960. And elections are um, widely seen as fair and fairly representative. You know, there's one argument, I'm not sure if it's entirely true, that they were the fairest elections Congo has ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and Lumumba is, you know, wins the most and is therefore asked to form the government and, and become prime minister. Right. And now we get into the crisis that happens. Right. So he forms the government. He has to essentially enter into a power sharing agreement with Kasavubu in some way. Mm -hmm. And what happens then? So he, Lumumba wins the most votes, but he doesn't win an outright majority. And, and the election really, um, one observer called it an ethnic census because it really just revealed how uh, divided Congo was. So Lumumba has 23 ministers in his government the goal was inclusion, not coherence. They had to divide colonial era administrative departments to make more um, ministries. And 
so he and his his 23 ministers are in charge on you know june 30th right and so now what sets off the congo crisis what sets off the thing that eventually you end up flying to the congo some 50 60 years later to to research the mutiny so the black rank and file have long been underpaid uh underfed, having to take orders from their white officers. And upon independence, it becomes especially jarring that they're still saluting Belgians. You know, now they're raising the Congolese flag every morning instead of the Belgian flag, but they're still taking orders from Belgian officers. Um, so they rebel against them. And that's the spark that that ignites everything. It's not going right. Okay. So that's just to give you guys a little context and history for what Lumumba actually has to deal with. Um, there are so many other players because this is happening, you know, in the wake of World War II, right? Um, all of these colonial powers are now divesting either because they can't afford to keep them or, you know, financially or because of, you know, um, strong independence movements of these colonies. Um, Belgium, no different. But this is not in a vacuum. This is within the, con within the context of Cold War politics. This is within the context of a uh, essentially a, a newly formed United Nations or a United Nations that's maybe just about 12, 15 years old. Um, and you start to see the world mobilize or start to take sides. And so who are some of the international players that now get involved in this, in this escapade? Yeah, so in 1960, 17 African countries became independent and joined the UN that year. It was known as the Year of Africa. And there was this real sense um, that this was now a part of the world that was newly up for grabs in the Cold War um, for both the Soviets and the Americans. So it, there was not a sense that these countries could just go their own way and it didn't matter which side they picked and they could be neutral. Really, in the American view, you had to pick a side. And so there was a lot of alarmism about, you know, which way will this country go? You know, in 1958, um, Guinea had voted to not remain part of France and Soviets sent in advisors there. And it was seen as this, you know, dangerous Cold War event. And so from the American perspective, uh, a lot of Africa is up for grabs. And so it, America sort of feels torn between, do we be good allies with our European friends or do we, take the side of African nationalism so we can have as much influence as possible in this part of the world that's now coming into international life. Mm -hmm. So Doug Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the UN, is um, sees sort of managing the decolonialization, decolonization process as one of his main tasks. Um, the Americans are very wary of which way these countries will go. and. Um, the CIA has a station chief in Congo, a man named Larry Devlin, who's a pretty big figure in the book. So all eyes are kind of on on Africa um, at, in 1960. Let's talk a little bit about both Doug Hammarskjöld and Larry Devlin. Larry Devlin is this, is this enigmatic character that you do such a good job of describing in the book, but tell us a little bit about him. So he's the CIA station chief in Congo, and he's 37, 38 years old. Um, had no experience in Africa. And what that showed was how the CIA didn't think much was going to be happening in the former Belgian Congo. This was a sleepy colony where there was not much news being produced there. And so there was not reason to think that it would be a big Cold War crisis. When the crisis erupts, he finds himself at the most important um, CIA station in the world, arguably, at that time. And he's um, he's very much a man of action. He does not ask for permission. He asks, he acts first and begs for forgiveness later. Um, and really at that time in 1960 also, communications were so bad that you could get away with freelancing and sort of had to in a way. Um, so yeah, he's this, and he ends up playing a pivotal role in um, the events that lead to Lumumba's death. So at that time, and I'm just interested because you do a lot of deep research into this, you know, what is the U.S. perception? Because you're also you're also at this time, you know, that Lumumba is coming to power, switching on the United States side from 
Eisenhower to Kennedy. So you've got these, this transition of you know, an American general, now turned president, um, who, who has certain ideas about America's role in the world to Kennedy, who's coming in, who a lot of people think, is, think of as a neophyte in many ways, right? Um, now dealing with the continent, and, and as you said, um, a set of folks in the CIA who are maybe not so well-versed. What is America's understanding of, of Lumumba himself and of the Congo, and what's, what are the, the aims in the Congo? So America, I argue, sort of fundamentally misjudged Lumumba. Um, and just to add in a, a little more plot, so after the mutiny, after the secession of Katanga, Lumumba asks the UN for help. There's this peacekeeping mission. He's frustrated with it. So he asks the Americans for help and is rebuffed. And then he goes to the Soviets. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for him. Mm. But even before that, um, if you look at the CIA cables and the State Department traffic, there's a, a negative view of Lumumba forming. Um, and I think basically America really struggled to understand third world nationalism. Um, it couldn't distinguish anti-colonial, anti-European sentiment from broader anti-Western sentiment. So Lumumba himself, for instance, I would argue was very pro-American. He flew to the United States, tried to meet with Eisenhower, who was out of town, went to the State Department. He even called on the United States to send troops to Congo to stabilize his country, which is not someone who's not something that a pro-Soviet politician would do. But in America's sort of warped Cold War view, he was, you know, once he was playing footsie with the Soviets, that was it. It was unforgivable. And they, you know, viewed him as a, a vowed communist who would turn Congo red. Right. And how much of this, you know, we all know America at the time as well. And how much of the perception of Lumumba was also clouded by American racism? Yeah, so that was a, a consistent theme in the research. Um, let me just give you some examples. So the the broader attitude that Eisenhower and other officials had towards Congo was paternalistic, like the Belgians. So the, the Congolese were routinely referred to as children. Um, when there was a White House meeting uh, before independence, uh, someone is briefing the president and says, there are 80 different political parties in Congo, and Eisenhower quips, oh, I didn't know that many Congolese could read. Mm. Another advisor says, oh, the Congolese, they've just come down from the trees, and Eisenhower says something agreeing with that. Um, the U.S. ambassador to Congo joked that in a private letter that Lumumba was a cannibal. So there was this real, the racism was really imbued in a lot of the correspondence and meeting notes. And I think the main effect that it had was twofold. One, because the Congolese were political children, therefore they required supervision and constant intervention and couldn't be trusted to handle their own affairs. So I think that justified a lot of the meddling. And then the other thing is that Congo was portrayed as this uncivilized place where just violent bad things happen. And it was, you know, concerns about the constitution and sovereignty and all that were niceties that you had to abandon in the you know, Darwinian law of the jungle. So I think it, it was a, a constant theme throughout um, the material. I right, at. right. What's interesting, though, is that that's back in the 60s. And, you know, I think, you know, you're a, you are a, a magazines person, you're in media. And I'm just wondering how much of that impression from then has stuck in terms of the way that people describe what's happening in the Congo today. It, it, probably a lot. I mean, this, this sense of a place needing outside intervention and not being able to be trusted with its own politics and with its own affairs, I think that persists. Today, you know, back then it was the Soviet Union and the Cold War rivalry. Today, it's uh, China and Russia to a certain extent. And I think there's this sense on the part of US foreign policy, at least, that um, we need to push them in a certain direction. They can't just develop along their own political axis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, much of that I think remains. Yeah, and so let's go back. So we've got this setup again, this you know paternalistic attitude from Westerners of all stripes. And into the mix, we have the United Nations. We have Doug Hammarskjöld, who's you know, Secretary General, very charismatic in his own right, 
Um, and he's now managing the situation from a UN perspective. We've also got folks like Ralph Bunch, um, you know, who is also assigned through the UN to help manage this perspective. What's the UN's role in the Congo crisis in the 60s? And, and where do things, I mean, are they a hindrance? Are they a help? Like, you know, I think there's a lot of speculation as to what they were actually doing and whose side, if they were on a side, um, they were on. But what's going on with that? Yeah, so the UN sends in this massive peacekeeping operation. Ralph Bunch, who's an American diplomat high up at the UN. Happens, an African-American. African-American, um, one of the most prominent African-Americans in public life at the time. Um, he's dispatched to Congo not for the crisis, just as the representative to independence, and then becomes the on the ground person running everything. And so the the goal was to stabilize the country and replace the um, replace the Belgians in many way, providing security, but also doing some of the technical things and you know running the airports and that sort of stuff. The big problem, however, was that they the UN could never get into Katanga, the secessionist province. They feared, Hammarskjöld feared there'd be a war if they did so. Uh, Lumumba couldn't understand. I invited the UN peacekeepers in. I'm, why can't I tell them to go into this province that's still part of my country officially? So so for folks who don't know, let's describe Katanga a little bit. Where is it geographically in the Congo and what's happening there at this moment? Southeast, it's um, one of six provinces at the time. And... It's yes. where all the minerals are, the copper. So at this time, it borders what other countries? Uh, Northern Rhodesia, which and, is now, which is now Zambia, um, and what else would it border to the uh, west of that? I'm, right. I'm having so think... trouble picturing that. But the <laughs> the main relevant one is um, is Northern Rhodesia, which was also which was white ruled, and Katanga had a significant Belgian settler presence. So there was this fear that um, in breaking off, it would sort of make common cause with the other white run um, entity across the border. Um, also, however, in Katanga, there was, there was a man named Moise Chambe, who's one of the sort of villains of my story, um, who led the secessionist province. Um, and, you know, he made common cause with the white Belgians in sort of promoting secession. Right. And so Lumumba is really trying to keep this whole country together, prevent secession, calls in the United Nations. And, you know, you've got Ralph Bunch there trying to run things. You've got Hammerschold doing the diplomacy at the high level. Meanwhile, he's still dealing with mutinous um, army folks who sometimes are on his side, sometimes are not on his side. What? How is he moving about Congo? What's he doing in this time? So he's um, struggling to maintain control. He also makes the decision understandable from one perspective, not from another, to leave the country and go on this trip to the U.S. Uh, in late July 1960. And then he takes his time coming back, going through various African capitals. And so he ends up being out of the country for like two weeks during the most crucial time. Mm, not not uh, necessarily a good thing to do. It proved to not be a good thing. I mean, and so when he's here in the United States, what's his agenda? Um, so in New York, he actually went to Harlem 125th and, right. and 7th Avenue. Um, but his main agenda in New York was to meet with Hammarskjöld and try and convince the UN to send in troops to that breakaway province of Katanga. That failed. They had three meetings. They they were talking past each other and, and they hated each other by the end of it, really. And then in D.C., he was hoping to get American aid. Again, he was rebuffed. Um, despite much pro-American rhetoric on his part. I think he tried to see the president. He tried to see Alan Dulles as well. And each one of these times, no one, basically no one picked up the phone. He tried to see Eisenhower. Eisenhower was out of town already you know, on a planned uh, outing. He did meet with the Secretary of State, Christian Herter. He was denied a meeting with the two presidential candidates, JFK and Nixon. Um, and at the meeting at the State Department, it, that went poorly, and you know he asked for all these things and just got no, 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 no. Right, and so this is a man whose trip outside has essentially been a colossal failure. He comes back to the Congo, and what's going on at that time? He declares that his trip has been a massive success on the radio, and that's another thing about the <laughs> You really admire the, the chutzpah of him. Um, he's constantly spinning. Uh, 
he comes back to the Congo and things are bad. He's there are protests against him. We later find out they were funded by the CIA and arranged by Larry Devlin. Um, and there's this movement afoot to have the president, Kasavubu, fire Lumumba and oust him from power, which was this sort of legally dubious maneuver. Again, that was at the encouragement of the CIA, um, which even approved financing for the president to encourage him to make this move and get rid of Lumumba. Because by that point, Lumumba had asked the Soviets for help. He had threatened to kick out the UN. Um, and also, this may be the time to mention this crucial White House meeting where Eisenhower, after hearing about Lumumba's latest antics, says something to the effect of Lumumba needs to be gotten rid of physically. Mm. And so that sets off this whole thing about who ends up killing Lumumba. A lot of talk about the Belgians, the CIA. Can you walk us through the plot that is at the center of your, of your book? Sure. So Eisenhower's comments, uh, he says these comments looking at Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA. Dulles eventually gets to work and has the CIA chemist, a man named Sidney Gottlieb, um, procure poisons and fly them to Congo that Devlin, the CIA station chief, is to put in Lumumba's food or toothpaste, poisons that will kill this man within a matter of hours or days. Right. Um, what that plot actually sort of fizzles out because uh, meanwhile, Lumumba's been, Kasabubu does fire him. Lumumba says, no, you can't fire me, I fire you. So they've fired each other. Right. And then Mobutu, we haven't talked about in a while. Uh, he comes back into he the He comes picture. back. He's head of the army now. And he steps into the void and says, I'm in charge. Mm. He says, this is not a military coup. It, in fact, was exactly a military coup. And so um, he throws Lumumba under house arrest. And therefore, Devlin can't get the poisons into his house. So that plot sort of fizzles out. Mm. And at this time, what's Kasavubu doing? He's hiding away in his Riverside mansion, basically not doing much. Um, right. So there's this period where Mobutu, he's neutralized both politicians, uh, but he hasn't really picked a side. And they call the journalists call him the Hamlet of the Congo because he mm. can't make up his mind. So you, the picture you paint of Lumumba in this is of a very young, indecisive figure, very much not the you know leopard skin cap wearing person that is you know kind of the 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 picture that's painted of him later on in life but this is this is a young guy right how old is uh mobuta i think he's 28 something this like is that 20 year old guy who's now tasked with heading the whole of the yeah. congolese military which is in mutiny right. at this time in various places he's trying to quell this um and he can't make up his mind like tell us a little bit about Mobutu because I think it, Mobutu at 28 very different from the very Mobutu different. we know yeah he would become this you know uh caricature of an African dictator you know powerful or oppressive but at this point he was a colonel who was quivering he was talking to the Americans asking for advice then he'd go talk to the UN and ask for different advice um there was a report that he was taking tranquilizer pills to calm his nerves one cable I saw said that he lost 30 pounds, which is probably an exaggeration, but you know, shows how, how uh, widely known his nervousness was. He was drinking too much. Um, he could not decide. He sort of did this coup and then instantly regretted it and mused about walking it back and pretending it had never happened. Um, but ultimately, uh, he acts against Lumumba and puts him under house arrest. But which is really interesting because this is a person who really looked up to Lumumba. Mm -hmm. It's not like he he I mean he admired Lumumba. I think that's why it it uh, was such a painful decision for him and why he hemmed and hawed for so long because Lumumba had made him politically. This was his mentor, um, his patron, and now and, and the man who had just given him the job of being head of the military right. you know, turned out to be a big mistake on Lumumba's part. Um, so yeah, there was a real personal betrayal element going on. Right. And so, you know, just to to sort of close out this thing. So now he's kicked out. Lumumba's under house arrest. He ends up, he ends up escaping, right, and moving around the country. 
um, right, to galvanize support? And how do we get to Lumumba's demise? So Lumumba escapes, he hides under the legs of servants in the back of a car and slips through the rings of troops outside his house. And he wants to go to his political home base, Stanleyville. Uh, he ends up being caught with CIA help, which helped arrange the search party, and flown back to the capital, roughed up in front of news cameras. And Mobutu is actually watching there, laughing at him. So again, to get to that personal element. And Mobutu realizes that house arrest won't work, so he decides to throw Lumumba in a military prison. And this is, you mentioned the transition from Eisenhower to JFK, this timing becomes important. We're in December, 1960, the Eisenhower administration is on the way out. Kennedy is about to come in in January. And so people start to worry on the ground in Congo because Kennedy is seen as having a potentially more pro Lumumba policy. Mm. He might be open to releasing Lumumba, striking some sort of deal, allowing him to come back as prime minister, something Eisenhower would never have countenanced. And so Mobutu is worried about this. And also Larry Devlin is worried about this. He detests Lumumba, think he's, thinks he's unstable, will allow Congo to turn communist. The worst possible thing would be for Lumumba to come back to power. Right. Meanwhile, Lumumba is so charismatic that he's winning over some of the guards who are guarding him at this military prison. And so there's an acute fear, which was real, that Lumumba would be sprung free and potentially return as Because he's minister. just that charismatic. Yeah. I mean, think about it. The, the people who are with guns guarding him, he was talking to them and, and convinced some segment of them uh, to maybe free him. Right. Um, so Mobutu decides he has to send, he has to get rid of Lumumba physically, but he doesn't want to do the dirty work himself. So he outsources it. So he decides to send Lumumba to a province where he will certainly be killed. There's Katanga, and then there's also this other secessionist province of South Kasai. Um, he tells Larry Devlin this. They're in constant conversation about all sorts of decisions. Devlin's basically a advisor to the government at this point. He's giving suitcases of briefcases of cash to Mobutu. The CIA has approved this massive bribery program. So Mobutu tells him, I'm about to send away Lumumba to his death. And Devlin does two things. One, he doesn't try and talk Mobutu out of that. He doesn't say, maybe you shouldn't do this, Lumumba will die. And everyone knows what will happen. And two, he keeps Washington out of the loop. So even as he's updating headquarters about other events going on, he deliberately does not tell them about the biggest event that's about to happen, which is Lumumba's transfer and death. And he keeps this information to himself because he knows that because that there, there's a transition going on, he'll be told, put the brakes on this. We can't have a big political development happening in Congo. This is a matter for the new administration to deal with. And right. so Lumumba is sent to Katanga on January 17th, 1961, tortured for hours, brutally. Moise Chambe, the leader of that province, gets blood on his suit participating in the torture. And then Lumumba is driven into a remote clearing in the forest where a local Congolese firing squad answering to Belgian officers, because there are still Belgian officers in that province, uh, shoots him, and, and those Belgian officers were answering to the local secessionist government. So Lumumba dies three days before Kennedy took office. Wow. And it's not just that he's shot, it's also that they're extremely brutal in terms of the way that they dispose of him. Yeah, so he's buried. He's Then the next day he's exhumed, buried again, exhumed because the secessionist leader doesn't really know what to do with his body and wants it to go, wants all evidence to be destroyed. And so he's his body is eventually dissolved in sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. And one of the, it's a um, Belgian police commissioner who's in charge of that job. And he actually takes uh, two of Lumumba's teeth and one of his finger bones as sort of gruesome souvenirs. So there's a real, 
know, that was the result of a long process of dehumanization. Right. And I think even till today, right, there's still been um, issues about repatriating those uh, parts of Lumumba. Well, last year in 2022, and this is sort of the coda to my book or the um, the end of it, the tooth, which the, the daughter of the Belgian police commissioner kept it as a, you know, her father died, she kept this tooth. And then in 2016, the Belgian police seized it from her and Last year, it was finally returned at the request of the Lumumba family back to Congo. Wow. Wow. And put in a casket, which is now in a mausoleum in, in Kinshasa, the capital. Wow. And so that is the terrifying arc of a supremely charismatic person. Um, and this is, uh, forms the, the, I mean, this is the substance of your book. But, you know, there are a few other questions, I think, that, that, um, I have about what it means to write about so charismatic and so outsized a historical figure. I mean, you know, y'all are here because you know something about Lumumba. He is the ultimate Pan-Africanist. He is, as Tunde said, an inspiration to so many, the kind of leader that uh, the continent needed then and that maybe we need now, but also a very interesting and flawed person. And, you know, you're now writing this 400 page book about this person, about the plot to kill this person, you know, about a largely uh, mythologized figure. What was that like? Yeah, so the, a real mythology sprung up around him. The, the original mythology in the West was, as I said, that he was this unreliable, totally erratic, vaguely pro-Soviet, um, you know, disaster of a leader. The more enduring mythology over time has been that um, he was really adopted as a hero of the left. Um, Sartre wrote this you know, introduction to his collected speeches. And um, you know, the, the coffee shop where I used to live in Brooklyn had a Lumumba t-shirt. So there's he really became this symbol. My reaction to that or my strategy for dealing with all of that was to just sort of totally set aside all the mythology and focus on. What do we actually know about what he said, what he did, what other, what his allies thought of him, what his enemies thought of him, and just focus on the facts and the contemporaneous history, um, and and set aside the mythology. Um, and it's interesting, Mobutu himself, the man who sent Lumumba to his death, would within like, you know, I think six years after Lumumba's death, just totally pivot and reclaim Lumumba as his own ally and claim mm -hmm. that Lumumba was the victim of colonialist machinations, even though Mobutu himself had a big role in his part death. And fossil of that, um, yeah. So there were, there, his legacy has been contested sort of since the day he died. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen that in different films and different plays, even Aimé Césaire, Raoul Peck, um, uh, getting at sort of the, the heroic figure of Lumumba, Lumumba the symbol, as opposed to Lumumba the, the administrator, Lumumba the leader. Um, when you, when you, uh, sorry, sorry, let me, let me go to this, which is in order to be able to construct this story, I mean, this was years of research in the Kong, but also archival research. I mean, you went through records and records and records. What was it like trying to access those state department cables or some of the CIA, um, you know, cables, like how, how did you get access to that? And how did that help you form your understanding? Yeah, well, a lot has been declassified over the years. Um, but to my frustration, a lot still remains declassified. So for instance, there's, the CIA has an internal history written after the fact of its anti-Lumumba operations in Congo, a 54-page document. We know the title, the subtitle, and how long it is, but that's still classified in full. You know, 63 So you know years. that it's 54 pages, you know what it's called, but, but nothing. I mean, nothing about it. And there's been a FOIA request for it that's been pending, not made by me. Um, and I mean, I just think it's ridiculous that there should be any secrets about what happened 63 years on. Um, so there were certain things that were not available to me. Um, but one important thing was that all the documents were basically written by Americans or Belgians or UN officials. And so because of the chaos in Congo, there were no, there are very few Congolese archival documents. And so my strategy for dealing with that was to bend over backwards to compensate for it and, you know, rely on oral histories from the Congolese side. I interviewed Lumumba's uh, two of his children when I went to Congo. 
Um, there are a lot of sort of obscure memoirs from the 60s and 70s written by Congolese politicians. Um, and so the, the goal was to give the full perspective because I think so often it had been written through, um, through the eyes of Western officials. And Lumumba's final letter to his wife even says, you know, one day the history will be written and it won't be the history written in Washington or Brussels. Um, you know, I'm not sure I'm capable of achieving that given that I'm not in Congo, but that was the goal to really bring back the Congolese side of the story. Right, right. And so that, so there was a real concerted effort to get those oral histories and to speak to people. Yeah. Um, I think you said Thomas Kanza's biography was, was helpful for you. Yeah. In constructing the Mumba as a, as a human. Yeah. I think it's now out of print, but, um, but it's a, if anyone gets their hands on it, it's a wonderful book about this. I mean, it, it, he's an ally of the Mumba, but he's this deeply frustrated friend who sort of keeps trying to save Lumumba from his own worst impulses, but ultimately can't. Just can't, just yeah. can't. Now let's talk a little bit about the implications of what happened in Congo for Congo today and also for U.S. foreign policy today. I mean, it's kind of an, maybe an unfair question to ask, but what do you think would have happened if Lumumba had been able to lead the Congo? And that's, that's the million dollar question. And there's sort of different versions of answers. I think where I come down is what did happen was so bad. So you had Mobutu installed by the US, stays in power until 1997, runs an incredibly kleptocratic, repressive, dysfunctional, chaotic regime that finally just the bottom falls out and it collapses, leading to one of the you know, deadliest civil wars in, in recent history. So that, what really happened was so bad that it wouldn't take you know, many alternative futures are much better than that. Right. So, you know, Lumumba's son told me he thought Lumumba, his father would be a social democrat. Um, and I think there's some truth to that, that like he was not the leftist that his enemies or his eventual uh, defenders would portray him as. Um, so I think there was a good chance that anyone who led Congo would have had an, a very difficult task and maybe wouldn't have stayed in power that long, maybe would have taken an authoritarian turn. But any almost anything alternative history would have been better than the real history. Mm. I want to open up to folks out here who I'm sure have lots and lots of questions for Stuart. Um, if we have a mic, um, let's pass that around. I'm going to ask that you ask a question, though, because I know sometimes people like to come and you know say their piece. So. Um, I will cut you off. I'm just giving you a fair warning. Um, but um, if folks have questions from the audience for Stuart, let's uh, open that up now. We have we have a couple from the live stream. Though. Okay, and so yeah, if you want to. Sure. I wanted to know from Stuart, could you give us some more information about what happened when the Mumba came to Harlem when he came to New York City to visit? Yeah. So he. Um... He came to 125th Street and 7th Avenue, and I don't think he even intended to get out, but he was sort of surrounded by supporters and gave an impromptu speech, which was very much a thing Lumumba liked to do. Um, and uh, his advisors, uh, there was a, a quote from uh, one of his advisors looking around in Harlem and saying, oh, they're all Africans here. This is great. And so I think it was a you know, most of their business was down in the UN, but there was this brief trip to Harlem where he was, uh, I think he was even carried on the shoulders of his supporters. This actually comes from Thomas Kansas' book uh, where we learned what happened when they he came to Harlem. Just uh, before we go to the next question, speaking of Lumumba speeches, you do a good job of going through some of them uh, here. I mean, I, I think of this incident at uh, the uh, handover where the King of Belgium is there or uh, and um, he gives a speech and then Lumumba gets up and gives this speech. I don't know if you want to read a little bit of this speech. It's on page 120. Um, sure. After, after, I mean, and it just shows the, the disconnect um, between the Belgians and their understanding of what was going on in the Congo versus what um, Lumumba is about. I'll I'll read just a a, a little bit of the the um, Belgian uh, king's words. Um, For eighty years, Belgium sent to your soil the best of its sons, first to deliver the Congo basin from the odious slave trade that was decimating its population, then to bring together the various ethnic groups that were once enemies. 
uh, and then uh, Badawin eulogized the pioneers of Belgian colonialism as selfless do-gooders, singling out Leopold II for having ruled not as a conqueror, but a civilizer. He reminded the audience of the, the cities and the railroads, the highways, the shipping routes, airports, factories, farms, hospitals, and schools that the Belgians had built, along with the remarkable progress they had achieved with respect to living conditions and hygiene. With Belgium having agreed to place all this in jeopardy, he continued, it is now up to you, gentlemen, to show that we were right to trust you. Now, this is really hard to read. Independence, he explained, is not achieved through the immediate satisfaction of simple pleasures, but through work. Um, and this, he even uh, though the keys were being handed over, he warned the Congolese, do not jeopardize the future with hasty reforms and do not replace the structures that Belgium has given you until you are sure you can do better. I mean, those are some strong words. Um, and then Lumumba responds with this intense speech. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. So I'll just read it an excerpt from it. Um, and Lumumba had not been on the program. This was a sort of impromptu speech. He, he got wind of what uh, King, Le King Baudouin was going to say, and then wrote his own sort of rejoinder to it. So he says, we have suffered contempt, insults, and blows, morning, noon, and evening, because we were Negroes. Who can forget that a Black was addressed by the familiar Chu, certainly not as a friend, but because the formal Vu was reserved for whites alone? We have known that our lands were seized in the name of supposedly legal texts that recognized only the rights of the strongest. We have known that the law was never the same for whites and blacks, accommodating for one, cruel and inhumane for another. And he goes on, but um, right. I mean, I think it, it really spoke to the, uh, King Baudouin was representing the Belgian view, which was, we did this great thing. We created this wonderful land for you and, and you should be grateful for it. And Lumumba, saw that and just you know could not sit silent and had this parting shot um which caused the king to consider leaving and abandoning you know in protest lumumba's supporters loved it it was broadcast across radios across the country um and it was you know both a heartfelt expression of truth and also a, a savvy political move mm, right do we have another question from the audience? Or Tunde, if we have um, uh, from also the live stream, but I think up here. Uh, hello, thank you very much for being here. My question would be, um, so considering the policy of Belgium in Rwanda, which was really, really different from uh, Congo, I was just wondering, like, um, uh, for instance, in Rwanda, they were like collaborate with the Tutsi, and in Congo, it was like quite the opposite, as you were saying. So I was just wondering, why is there this uh, like big difference? Is it because it's larger or the ethnical or like, yeah. Yeah, so Congo inherited uh, Rwanda and Yurundi from Germany, it received them after um, World War One, I, I think. And so you're right, the, the colonial strategy that was different there, it relied more on allying with the local elite. Um, I don't know all the reasons for that because I was so focused on the Belgian Congo, but their, the jewel in their crown, the main thing they cared about was certainly the Belgian Congo. And I think Rwanda and Yurundi were, I mean, in addition to being much smaller and having fewer resources were not really the the focus of their, their efforts um, and sort of were, I think uh, they were also administered technically by the UN, although largely by Belgium, I believe. So that's another difference there. And the reason folks cared about the Congo so much back then is is a similar reason to why the Congo is so important today, right? Which is its natural resources. You know, I began the book expecting to find that um, that would be a huge motivation. In fact, it wasn't particularly salient um, at that point. So. Congo made the uranium that was in one of the bombs that was dropped over Japan at the end of World War II, but by 1960, it was no longer exporting uranium to the US, and I think maybe to anywhere, in fact. And all the minerals that Congo had could be found in greater quantities elsewhere. Um, it certainly explained a lot of the Belgian behavior and interest, but from an American perspective, it was all 
Cold War domino theory, um, you know, the the economic stuff really didn't explain much. I think. Right. Interesting. Okay. And then tune to the live stream questions if you want to. Okay. Hey, good evening. I have a question uh, regarding the Pan Africanness. Do you think every time when a leader, an African leader, try to exteriorize the Pan Africanism, the case of Lumumba is repeated? Um, especially in the French speaking countries in Africa. What do you think about it? Yeah, so Lumumba very much saw him as a pan, himself as a Pan-Africanist. And this um, really developed in 1958 when he went to the Pan-African conference in Accra. And it was there, it was like he had this awakening that, oh, there are other people in other African colonies that are part of the same struggle that I am. And so he brought that back to Congo and his rhetoric changed completely. And he started speaking in, in much more Pan-African terms and making reference to the the common struggle. He held a conference. One of his sort of bad decisions was in the height of the crisis, he decided to call a conference and have a Pan-African conference in Congo, which was a disaster because you know nobody came and it was you know, too chaotic. But um, yeah, that that part of Lumumba's legacy is is real. He was a Pan-Africanist and believed deeply in it. And the part about you know the. I think it was essentially a question about like can a pan Africanist leader some survive or will they invariably meet Lumumba's fate? What's your thought? I don't think it was Lumumba's pan Africanism that so offended the Americans so much as his um, outreach to the Soviets. So I we're think. agreeing that the Americans are responsible for Lumumba's death. Uh, a lot of people are responsible, but I think there's this key link in the chain where the CIA station chief, um, you know, gives a green light to Mobutu to send Lumumbus to his I death. I just wanted to get you on record saying oh, that. Oh, <laughs> happily. It's in the book, too. Uh, Tunde, I think we have a question from the live stream. Uh, is on? We have a couple from the live stream. Uh, first one is about sort of the legacy of the Belgian colonial experience in the Congo and sort of what remains of it today. How do Congolese people remember or think of Belgium and that period in their history? You know, I wouldn't be the best person to answer this question, but my sense is that um, it's complicated because there's still a lot of ties with Belgium. Um, a lot of Congolese have family in Belgium and vice versa. I know that um, it's not unheard of for Congolese to name their children Baudouin after mm -hmm. the Belgian king. Um, so I think there's a recognition of the cruelties of colonialism. Um, but also, in a, you occasionally hear a sort of strange nostalgia for it too. So it, it's complicated. Hmm. And, this, and this one might be outside the scope of the book, but there, uh, someone also wondered sort of what are more contemporary um, perspectives or perceptions of Lumumba and the DRC today? Sort of how is he remembered by people who maybe didn't live through his life and death, but remember him as a political icon? Yeah, I mean, he's still largely popular and you see his face on t-shirts and and wraps in the Congo today um, but it also varies a little bit by region so there are many in Katanga who still despise Lumumba but um but I think he he's you know become a myth everywhere but um and a legend and a, a sort of larger than life figure but especially in Congo mm. I got one more for you, if that's okay, from on, online. They have a lot on, of questions. Take, take uh, all the time you want, Tunde. <laughs> this is going to be about me. Um, no, the last question was sort of also about this idea of, um, yeah, the current conflict in the region and sort of to what extent is that reflective of historical things versus, versus not? Yeah. So to me, the root cause of much that ails Congo today. And it's still a country that's very poor, that has over 120 armed groups active in the East. There's still a UN peacekeeping operation there. The, the parallels are sort of eerie. Um, the, the government is repressive and, and not representative. 
I think a lot of that could be traced to the Mobutu era. That's sort of, if you had to pick one main cause, it's having 30 plus years of dictatorship and theft and repression. And, um, and that all began in 1960. Let me challenge you on that a little bit. Is it really just Mobutu? I mean, because you and I, I mean, we worked on this piece together that was published in your in your wonderful publication about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I was arguing that some of this repression is actually chased chased back further, right? To the way that the the structures or lack of structures put in place before. So I mean, before Mobutu, you had an extremely repressive state as well. Mm -hmm. So would that not also be contributing to, and and we talk about a state, right? But we're talking about, again, it's just really important, right? To think about the geographic size of this thing. Western Europe, right? How many countries are in that whole thing? I mean, you got like what, 14, 15 countries in Western Europe, probably more, 20 something. And the Congo is the size of that. So is it is it a place that, and I, maybe I'm wading into murky territory, but is it a place that should be a country? I mean, that is murky territory. And there's a whole, uh, <laughs> I'm just putting there's you in on fact the, spot, a but... whole fear among Congolese today that the West wants to break it up. And, you know, people, uh, there have been, you know, Americans have made the argument that Congo should be split up into four or five countries or whatever. I mean, my reaction is it's, it's too late to, to change, you know, to, break up the country. I think that would be a, a drastic move. You could make arguments about the degree of federalism or not. But back to your other point, I think, yes, of course, the the 75 years of Belgian colonial rule also had an effect. Um, and there's been work by academics showing that, you know, Belgium's institutions in Congo as, a pair, as compared to the French and British institutions in other colonies were much more aimed at extracting resources rather than building up a local capacity or sort of a more real economy. And so mm. that has had effect too. I mean, um, there are you know multiple sources obviously that you can point to. Right. Okay, we'll take one uh, or two more questions and then uh, do over here. Hi, my name is Bob. And uh, my question goes to, um, since King Leopold, the rubber trade to now and whatever when in the corner back then up to now has any country or any government or any company tried to fix the wrong that was done to the Congo any shape or form because I figured that at one point somebody gonna say well you know what let's let's do something over here but has any country or any company any company I'm thinking about Apple or any of those people has it has it been any in the past mm. So I guess that question about accountability, not just companies, but also, you know, perhaps even for for countries, for the United States, for Belgium, for the UN, has anyone taken any responsibility? And if so, how? And yeah. I think basically no is the answer to your question. Um, or, and, and today I had an op-ed in the Washington Post arguing that it's time for the U.S. to finally um, take responsibility for what the CIA did in Congo, open up the files, make a formal apology to Congo, and begin that process of um, sort of honesty about what happened. But no, I mean, it's it's a place that's been um, exploited and victimized repeatedly. And what are the odds that you think that will happen? That uh, someone will read my op-ed and decide to follow Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> low, but uh, there have been, in terms of the just the declassification aspect of it, there have been some encouraging projects. So the Obama administration had this effort to declassify documents about the U.S. role in the Argentine Dirty War of the 70s, and that um, was seen as this diplomatic peace offering to Argentina and, and a sort of coming to terms with the past. So it, there's no reason it can't be replicated with the Congo. Okay. Um, if we have any more questions, we'll take them now. Sure. Yeah, so Mobutu was a, a journalist, and that's how Lumumba first met him in the sort of intellectual circles in the capital. And, but he had also had this background of six or seven years serving in the military. So 
the movement sort of looking around, who do I know that has military experience? Oh, Mobutu, you were in the military, you're now in charge of, of the army. And Mobutu himself in an interview in the 80s said that Lumumba gave him the worst job, this thankless task of being in charge of the army. Of course, the irony is that it was through that job that his entire rest of his political career uh, began. So, uh, Stuart, I want to thank you tremendously for spending time with us here to talk about the Lumumba plot. And thank you for writing this, this brilliant book um, that really gets into the core of not only who Lumumba was, but also the intrigue surrounding his time in office. Um, it's a brilliant book. It's it's you we, as I said before, we've got copies uh, in the back. If you want to pick one up, uh, Stuart is here. Stuart will be signing um, for uh, everybody, so you all should get these books. Um, and you know, again, I just I really want to thank you for for the work that you've done um, and and for spending time discussing your work with us here today. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Um, so before I release you all to grab your books and get them signed, um, just so you know, you can follow us here at the Africa Center at, at the Africa Center on all of the socials and the channels. This talk will also be posted there. For those of you who watch C-SPAN, it will be on C-SPAN as well. Um, we got our C-SPAN people over there. Um, and really um, what the Africa Center about is about is these kinds of dialogues and bringing folks who've done really interesting in-depth research that helps to transform or reshape narratives about the content of Africa and its peoples um, to the fore. So, you know, again, follow us on social media, get on our newsletter. There'll be many, many more interesting talks, but again, Stuart, thank you very much for, for your time with us. Home isn't just where we're from. It's the sounds that move us. The stories that shape us. And the flavors that heal us. It's the communities that connect us. The ones that hold us down. The ones that raise us up. Home is a feeling we all know. So if you're looking for it, you can always find it here. The Africa Center. Home is here. Okay, no, you good.